Come on in, come on in, stand up, sing with us, sing with us today, stand on up. All right, let's stand and sing. to the Denver Church of Christ. Welcome also to those of you joining us online. We're so happy to have you with us today. My name is Sam. This is my good friend Cam. Uh, and we're both college students here and we attend the Colorado School of Mines. And so, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so we started school a couple weeks ago and this morning we just wanted to share some good news about how we've seen God working in both of our lives. So Cam is going to share first. All right, well, everyone, good morning again. It's just so good to be here. I'm so excited for the start of the semester. I'm excited for football season. Shout out to the Buffs for a dominant win yesterday. And uh, mine's also as a football team. Believe it or not, we don't just do math. And they're pretty good. They're 2-0 as well. So I'm just excited for that. That's good news. Uh, but even more than that, I'm excited for the victories that God's bringing in our lives. Something I've been especially inspired by lately is just the way people in our campus ministry have been reaching out to their friends, bring people out. I'm especially inspired by my man Colin over here. Uh, he did an internship this summer. is just bringing out so many friends from that. And it's just exciting to see the way God's working in just so many different people's lives in the younger generations. Yeah. Um, and then in lieu of our first song, Praises Heard Around the World, I actually had the opportunity to spend my summer in Thailand with our church over there in Bangkok, Thailand. 
Um, and even just since we've left, it's been so encouraging. They've been sending us updates every week of pictures of them in Bible studies, still reaching out on campus. And since the beginning of the summer, four people have studied the Bible, gotten baptized, and chosen to make Jesus Lord, which is so encouraging. Yeah. But it's just so awesome that we serve a God who's just making himself so evident, not only here in Colorado on our campuses, um, but also all around the world. And so Cam is going to pray for us. All right, let's pray to start our service. Well, dear God, I'm just so grateful for the opportunity to be here with you. I thank you that your mercies are new every morning, that you're here with us today. I pray you be here with us throughout this service. Speak through Hans as he shares your word and just speak into our lives as only you can throughout the rest of this time, throughout the rest of our weeks as we seek to glorify you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, let's stand and sing. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider.
to seek your face, Lord, all I am is yours. My whole life I place in your hands, God of mercy, humbled I bow down in your presence at your throne. started a series here looking at the book of Ephesians, and uh, what a great book uh, to be able to, to get in there, 
and dig into that together. I think it's, uh, it's been helpful. I know Lee did a great job this last week, you know, kind of going in there, digging in some of the, the history from the past even, and uh, some of looking at uh, the promises of Abraham and the different things that are in there that God is doing and trying to do through us in his church is always encouraging. And, uh, you know, it's great to be here this Sunday as well. It's finally feeling a little bit like fall with, uh, you know, the, the little bit change in seasons and the, uh, the, the weather coming around a little bit. It's encouraging. Love being able to be here together worshiping, worshiping God as well. And, um, you know, the author of this book is Paul, and I love Paul, because Paul really didn't like Christians very much, and we all know a Christian that we don't like very much, right? I mean, pe- you can laugh or you can shake your head, but I go, all of us go, yeah, that, that's kind of true. Like, he was so against Jesus, so against those people, that he went out, he got them arrested, he had them imprisoned, he had several of them killed to that point. Now, prayerfully, none of us are at that level. But as he talks in this chapter about the hostility that's there, that's the level of hostility that we're talking about. That literally to the point of death, going, I dislike you so much, I want you to die. Now, the election is coming up in a few months, right? And we're not too far from that when you look at some of the stuff going on in social media and all these different things. But but what I love about Paul is that he has this encounter with Jesus, and he is completely changed from it. He doesn't just kind of sort of change a little bit. He has radically changed. Now, what's really cool is he has this really amazing experience, and then it took a while for him to be shaped and to be molded and to be changed into who God really wanted him to be, which I can relate to as well, right? Because good things can happen, and then sometimes it it takes a little bit. But ultimately, Paul really understood that he was changed by God's grace and God's mercy And overall in Ephesians, Paul really summarizes this great piece of like, hey, the the good news, the gospel, and how it should reshape every part of every person's story who wants it to be be changed. And uh, this week, we're going to look at chapter two, and we're going to see how we can be rooted in love, that it's the foundation of our belonging in the family of God. And, uh, you know, Paul wrote this letter to Ephesus from prison several years after he had been there. And, uh, you know, God uses this, just this masterful image of what we were like before and what we can be like in Christ. And so in the past, this is the first section, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. He says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us lived among them at one time gratifying the the craving of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, and we'll stop right there, and we'll catch up here in in a little bit. But but ultimately, we look and you go, this is really cool. Our past, this first little section here, verses one through four, it, or it, it's amazing seeing what's happened here. Because the first part we see in verse 1 is that we were all spiritually dead. Before we embrace this salvation, before we come to know who God is, we were all spiritually dead. We were shackled by the grave, by this reality of the separation from God. And our sin had just woven this tapestry of despair, of discouragement, of trying to fulfill ourselves, of selfishness, and just leading us down this path of just condemnation. You know, and I think if you've been a Christian for a while, and some of us have been a Christian for a while, it's hard to remember what we were like and what that that felt like, right? We can be so far removed from it, we can forget the death. We can forget what that felt like, right? You know, and I go, it's like losing someone when they physically die, and then years later you go, yeah, I still miss them, I'm always affected by it. But we, we sometimes forget what that felt like in the moment, how raw that was, how much it affected us, how that, there was this, this tearing in there. And God goes, that's what you were like. And maybe you go, well, that's not what I was like. That's what I am like right now. Well, that's okay, too. There's a great message in all of this for you as well. Because I go, we, we, there's so much death that occurred in there. There's the physical death, right? You got war and murder and, and, and just genocide and all those things that, that when before we follow Jesus that can separate us. Or you think about the emotional death, the guilt and the fear, the insecurity, the anger, the apathy, the depression. You go, just just the death that can happen there? 
of what it can be like when we're not connected to God. Or the relational death. I mean, think about all the relational death that happens in our world. Divorce and bitterness, resentment, adultery and cheating and just taking advantage and, and just using people. I go, relationally, there, there's, there's so much death there. But, but in verse 1, he talks about just this spiritual death. Just this not knowing who God was, worshiping the things of the world, right? You know, we're, I'm going through the Bible in a year, reading in, in um, um, Isaiah and then in, in Psalms. And both today was talking about idol worship. And I was like, I'm so glad we don't worship idols. And I was like, and then it was like, the works of your hands, the things that you have built, those things that you, you treasure. And I was like, okay, we totally have idols. <laughs> right? And I think sometimes we're removed from it and we forget it. And then eternal death. That ultimately, if you die separate from God, you are eternally separated from God. You go, oh, can you say that, Hans? Well, I just did, because the Bible does. And it's, but it's one of those things where I'm like, ooh, I might get in trouble if I say that, because we're supposed to be like all-inclusive and, and, and make not, no, not make anybody feel bad. But I go, man, you think about what we're like apart from God, and we all feel bad. There's so much there that we miss out on because of this idea that just, there's just this problem that we're spiritually dead. The, the second thing here, this part B here is the past, in verse 2, that we're living in sin. Our days were marked by this stark contrast of God's holiness, that we're just ensnared by sin, we're, we're trapped in it, that we had no purpose, we're deceived by Satan, we're deceived by the sin, and we live these just selfish, sinful lives. And God goes, that's not at all what I want for you. Not because I'm controlling, but because it's miserable. And you're trying to get something that fulfills you, and you never do. God goes, I want something better for you. And then see here this passion, verse 3, that we're obeying the cravings of the flesh. And I think at our core, we are driven by lust. Lust for something. That's that idol worship. That's that, that pull for different things. There's a reason that they say sex sells. There's a reason that when they're trying to sell beer or a car, they use body images. Right? Because all of us, by our nature, by our birth, we're inclined towards that. We're inclined to rebel towards God. We're inclined to, to, to long after these things. And it doesn't have to be a physical person. Sometimes it's a shiny thing, right? And our hearts are in bondage to that. And it's just a cruel lie. Thinking that this thing will give us fulfillment, and it never does, and we always need another thing, and you always need another thing, and you always need another thing, or another person, or another relationship, or another sexual encounter, or another little more time on this pornographic site, thinking it'll give you some kind of fulfillment, and it never does. And God goes, I don't want that for you because it's never going to fulfill you. And he goes, it's just, it's, you're free to make your own decisions, do your own thing. And that's where you go, yeah, I'm free to make my own decisions. I'm free to do my own thing. And God goes, you absolutely are, but it's going to lead you to a place that's just miserable. And it's not what I long for you because I want something so much better. And verse 4 is where this starts to come around. He goes, e even in the depth of our sin, even in all of this stuff, he goes, just my immeasurable love, his grace is shining through. And his grace transcends my unworthiness, that he lavished his affection upon us. I love that word. It was in chapter 1, right? That, that he just lavishes this upon us. He extends us this offer. And so we, we can be steeped in this past of sin and darkness, and, and yet God has a, has a different plan. And the second part here is this power in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 5 through 7. So that we are made, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace that you've been saved. He just puts that little parenthetical statement in there. He's like, it's so awesome. I just got to throw it in there. He goes, and, and God has raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that the coming ages he might show us incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. God here, Paul here is saying, I am so excited about this because it's such an amazing thing. Verse 5 talks about his spirit, that it, it, it makes you alive. He goes, you're helpless and you've got this, this thing. And he goes, I'm going to breathe life into you. I'm going to give you new life. I'm going to make you alive. And, and it just it breathes life into those dead souls, all those dead things that you go, ooh, this is never coming back. God goes, no, no, I can bring it back. That's why there's the story of, of God bringing people back to life. You go, man, if he can bring a dead person back to life, surely he can bring back my emotions back to life or this relationship back to life. And, and he infuses us with the very life of Christ. And he goes, while we're still in, entangled in this, and I think we can forget what this was like too, 
right? You go, yeah, I can remember some of that sin and I still feel guilty about it. But we also should be just celebrating this new life and the Holy Spirit that comes into us at baptism that we go, you get this. Do you remember that part too? Like I can remember the night I was baptized sleeping so good going, man, if I die in my sleep, I'm going to go to heaven. Like I just, I remember that feeling that separated from God, but I also remember that feeling of that glory that, ooh, I'm connected with God and it's such an awesome thing. And it's such a tragedy if you forget the glory and the, and the amazing and the peace that comes from that. And that's why he continues on in this chapter. Verse 6, he goes, just the salvation that we're lit, raised to heavenly places. And just through this remarkable transformation, we're not just redeemed from our past life of sin. If that was it, that would be enough and that would be awesome. But he goes, it, it, so much more than that. He goes, more than just the forgiveness, more than the cleansing of our sin and our past, he goes, I've elevated you to heavenly places with Christ. Right? It's not just that he goes, you know what? Mm, okay, here's the deal. I'm not going to punish you for all eternity, but you're going to like have to feel bad about it forever. He goes, no, no, no. I'm going to elevate you to the heavenly places with Christ Jesus. That literally we're new humans with a new purpose and we're changed by God's love. We're rooted into this family of God. And he goes, that's what I want for you. That's why I'm telling you all this other garbage is so bad for you because I've got something that's so much better. And he goes, that we, you can be changed, that you can be rooted, that you can be established in this amazing love of God. In verse 7, part of this is this testimony of God's grace to other people. That this divine transformation isn't supposed to be concealed. That we're called to display this testimony of God's grace. That he goes, once your lives are marked with despair and discouragement, and now you have this radiant hope of salvation, and it just reveals God's power to transform right? And I go, think about this, like, how are you doing reflecting the glory of God? And here's what's interesting, right? I think we think as longer we're Christians, the more we should be totally perfect and not stand out and, and like have all of it together and be a nice, you know, put together and not have any issues and not have any problems and never need God and, and just like have it all figured out and, and, and we're just following all the rules, and I go, how does that then reflect God's power to transform us if you don't need to change anything? If I'm totally perfect and don't need Jesus, why would anybody else look like they need Jesus? Because it, but if they look at me and they go, you are a total mess. And yet, you have peace in this tragedy. You're a total mess and yet you're honest about your sin and trying to get help and being transformed by the Holy Spirit. I go, oh, I can do that. It's constantly amazing to me. Every time I like talk about like, all right, here's how I'm messing up and here's what's going on in my heart, people go, oh, thank you. I love that. So awesome. <laughs> like, is it? But there's something that is awesome about that, right? Because it's not like I'm totally perfect and how come you're not perfect? Because that would be really discouraging because I'm very clearly not perfect. And if we're really honest, none of us are which is why we need Jesus. And God's power isn't shown in our perfection. It's shown in our need for him and him changing us in spite of how messed up we are. It's God doing the heavy lifting. It's God transforming us. And that's what the, the goal is. That's what the desire is here. That that's his power. That's him showing this testimony, right? That's us reflecting it. And yet... There's times where we can look at this and go, our trans transformation is not only internal, but it's also me meant to be displayed and, and help other people. And if you need help seeing this more, look, keep on reading here in verses uh, 8 through 13. It says, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith. And this, not from yourselves, it's a gift from God, not by works so that no one can boast. Because it's not about all the good things you can try and figure out how to do. It's not being all kinds of perfect, right? It says, for we are God's handiwork. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Therefore, remember that you formerly, who were Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised, by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenant of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who are once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. 
verses 8 and 9, you're saved by grace through faith. And that our salvation isn't earned because we worked really hard and we've got all the great merits and we, and we checked the right boxes. No, it's a gift of God, which literally means unmerited favor. And it flows out of this channel of faith, allowing us to receive God's forgiveness and the eternal life, and, but it's a gift. And if you're always worried about a relationship that you have with somebody because of what you can offer them, that relationship is miserable, right? What I mean by that, if, if you have a relationship with somebody and you are constantly judged by what they can get from you and how you interact with them and are you meeting their standard, right? It's like Mean Girls Club, right? And, and that whole idea there of like, ooh, are you going to fit in? Are you going to do right? It's a miserable relationship. But that's not the relationship that we have. But see, if they love you for you, regardless of knowing you and knowing how messed up you are and they still love you, man, that's a joy. Like when you can just feel totally comfortable with somebody. You know, when I think about this, I picture our dear sister, Deborah. I know, Deborah, who happens to be Deborah's birthday today. Happy birthday, Deborah. <laughs> and, um, but I don't know if you've ever seen Deborah with kiddos. She has a deep love for small children, right? She had a daycare for years and years, and she still loves kids, which is amazing to me. Um, <laughs> but she's also a gift giver. And so she'll hear or she'll get to know those kids know, well enough to know what they would love. And then she'll bring them little, little presents or little things or things to play with. Or, you know, sometimes they get to use it and she takes it back for using it for somebody else or whatever. But, but to see her to giving to kids because of who those kids are in spite of who those kids are and the joy on both of them, I go, I think that's how God looks at us goes, yeah, I know you're screaming. I know you pooped your diaper a minute ago. I know that you have all these other issues. And I still love you. And I still want to bring you joy. And I still want to be with you in all of that. And I go, God wants to give you gifts, not because of what he gets, but because he loves you. And he loves giving. It's part of who he is. And I go, that's why he gives us this gift. Not because we have something to offer to him. We, by our nature, are objects of wrath, deserving wrath, separate, apart. And he goes, and still, I love you. And I want to be close to you. And that's that, 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 this amazing piece in here. And then I go, verse 10, he goes, you get to share in God's ongoing work too. You don't just get to reflect it. You get to, to, to not just stop it being saved. You get to be transformed because God loves you just as you are. But he also loves you not enough not to leave you that way. Right? Because you can love a baby and go, oh, I totally love you even though you pooped your diaper. Why don't you just sit in that poop? That's not love. Love is saying, hey, let's change that diaper. Let's help you get potty trained. Let's help you grow. Let's help you mature. Let's help you be, be transformed and molded into a, a functional human being as a child. And God does the same for us and has the same dream for us. He shapes us into vessels of his righteousness. He molds us into the image of Christ. He empowers us with the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. He saves us and then he purposes us to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And we get to do something with that amazing gift. You know, if Deborah gives a gift to a little kid and then they don't use it, you ever done that? Like you give a gift and they're like, huh, they set it down. Like the, it hurts. Like I take personal offense sometimes, right? And you go, it's a kid, whatever. But then there's like, you give the gift and then they can't stop playing with it. So we were at our community group and Deborah's there and, and there was this, I think it was a, like a, a frozen wand, like from the frozen, the, the movie. Let it go, let it go. So they, they pressed this button and it played a frozen song. And in the two hours we were there, it maybe was played 200 times. <laughs> to the point where the parents are like, where are the batteries? <laughs> but the smile on those little kiddos' faces. And the smile on Deborah's face, I gave you this gift, and you're using this gift, and you're loving this gift. That's what God wants for us. He goes, I've given you all this stuff, and now I want you to be able to use it and have joy in your heart and give joy to other people and just, just be like so excited about it to the point that maybe other people go, all right, enough. And there's a fine line there, right? We'll talk about that in a second, but... But in verses 11 through 13, the salvation, that we're united through Christ's blood, that prior to salvation, we're strangers, we're separate from God. But through the precious blood of Jesus, 
that we're set, reconciled to God, that we're brought near to him, that we're adopted into the family, and that through Jesus we have access to this family. And that love and the promises of God, all those Old Testament heroes that Lee talked about last week, all those promises, that's how we get it, through the blood of Jesus. And salvation is this gift of grace. It brings us back into God's loving embrace and these gifts and the purpose of God. They're, they're all given to us to, to help us, you know, create us and, and go, and, and they're supposed to stress us out, right? No, no, no. Like the opposite of that. They're there to bring us peace. And that's the next section, verses 14 through 18. Because these gifts and this using them and reflecting them is not supposed to be something that stresses us out and go, I have to feel guilty now. No. Just in the same way that you were saved by grace at the beginning, it's not by your good works that God loved you. It's not that it good works that he continues to love us. And yet at the same time, he calls us to good works. But he goes, there should be peace in all of this. Verse 14 says, for he himself, Jesus Christ, is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who are far away, and peace to those who are near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Verses 14 and 15, we have redemption, that we have peace through redemption. What's redemption? It's the act of buying back someone who was, uh, or rescuing someone, someone that was enslaved or lost or in a state of bondage. That God goes, I can redeem all of that stuff. And through the redemptive work of Jesus, that we get peace, peace that transcends human understanding. It's a peace that the world can't understand. It's a peace that you go, that's the part of reflecting God's nature when you go, Something horrible happened in your life, and you're at peace, and you're trusting God. The world can't comprehend it. Why? Because it flows out of the very heart of God. But it also, it takes away the separation, the law separated, the physical wall as well, right? And, and so if you, if you look here at this, there's a picture of the temple. And um, if, you look, if you look at the, this is like the old, old temple and, you know, here's like the inner courts and the holy place or whatever. So there's where the priests could go. And then here's like where the women's courtyard was outside of where the men could worship. And then here, that's where the Gentiles got to be, outside of the whole thing. Like, you know what? You can stand on the steps. That's good enough for you people. And so he's going, I'm doing away with the law that separates you. I'm doing away with these physical walls that separate you. And he goes, all of that. He goes, I want to remove it. I want to redeem it. I want you to be together. And you mean, think about the different walls that can be built up. I mean, you can be, you know, like you can be a, like a Broncos fan or like a Raiders fan. I mean, the walls that get built up there, right? Or you can think about how can that idiot be running for president again? Which idiot am I talking about? You don't know, right? <laughs> because each one of you instantly had one idiot, or maybe you go, nope, they're all idiots. <laughs> but right, like I go, that divides. And we can figure out so many things that here's why we should be separate. Here's why we should be different. Here's how we should, you know, do, do this and that. Versus, hey, how can we be more aligned that Jesus is Lord Let's focus on the, on the big things and not so much on some of the smaller things and unified with each other. How can we tear down these walls of hostility? And then verse 16, this reconciliation, restored relationship. In Christ, we're not only redeemed, but we're reconciled. That broken relationship between humanity and God, it's mended and we're, melt, we're welcomed back in harmony and in union with our creator. And reconciliation is this bringing two parties that are estranged or in dispute back together. And Jesus is who brings God and man back together. That it means change or exchange. This idea that the change of a relationship, an exchange of antagonism for goodwill, enmity for friendship, attitudes are transformed, and hostility ceases. That sounds like a church you want to be a part of, right? That sounds like a small group you go, I'd like to go to that one. Versus they kind of hate each other. Nobody wants to be a part of that. But through the power of God, we can be different. Then verses 17 and 18, the reception, that we've got access to God's presence 
through the bl blood of Christ that we've got unfettered access. We don't have to go through the curtain, through the priest, through the, all these other things to get access to Jesus. He goes, no, 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 you got access. You can talk to him face to face. And that veil's been torn. It's been separated. And it says we can boldly approach the throne of grace. And that peace of God that transcends the turmoil of this world, it offers us just a tranquil, 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 Tranquil refuge. Those are two hard words to say together right there. And then last, verses 19 through 22, just the picture of what this is supposed to look like. Verse 19, it says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people, and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are building, being built together as a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. In verse 19, just this conversion, that we're born into the family of God through faith in Jesus, that we can experience that profound transformation, that we're reborn into the family of God to become his beloved children, heirs of all of those promises that Lee talked about last week. In verse 20, that the cornerstone that is Christ himself, that Christ occupies the central and most pivotal position in all of it. You know, the cornerstone when they'd build an old building was, we've got to make sure this one's right. It'd be a big stone that they'd take both angles off of, make sure in that square, and then you build from that. Because if that one starts crooked, the whole thing is going to be a mess. And he goes, it's a pivotal position for where we're supposed to be. But it also talks about us being living stones and that we're intricately placed forming a spiritual temple, solidly grounded on the unshakable foundation of Jesus. You know, in Peter, it, it, it talks about us being living stones that were rejected by the human hands, but chosen by God and precious to him. And you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be holy priesthood. And they go, that that's what God offers us, that he wants this amazing thing for us. And, this, and ending here in verses 21 and 22, this construction that we're part of God's family and part of his kingdom. You're not only part of God's family, but also citizens of his eternal kingdom. And this transformation that comes through the new birth and, and gives, gives divine work through God's grace and ushers in this new identity and this new purpose. I go, when you get this picture of what God wants, he goes, yeah, yeah, there's this tension there of like, you are saved by grace. You can't work hard enough yet. I've got good works for you to do. You go, well, but, but, but wait, which one is it? I go, yes. And that's how so many things in relationships are and relationship with God is. And we can't separate the two. So what I want to do is we're going to just take like three minutes. We've got two quick questions that I want you to discuss with a neighbor uh, someplace close by. And if you're off, you know, maybe if you're new here, you're like, oh, wait a minute, I'm an introvert. Don't make me do this. Um, somebody may look around and go, oh, you're sitting by yourself. I want to come sit with you and just chat. And you, it's always okay to go, I need a pass. I'd love to just listen to you. That's fine too. But let's take a few minutes to discuss this and, and uh, pick a question or talk about something you want to talk about. Are those big enough to read? I think so. All right. Let's take uh, three minutes to discuss with somebody nearby and we'll come back and take communion together. Hmm. Gonna talk with the Costello.
All right. Well, hopefully you, you got a chance to discuss a little bit there. Um, and if you're new and, and an introvert, thanks for, uh, for giving us, or I guess if you're come around all the time and an introvert, thanks for, uh, for helping with that. But, you know, I think that there is a piece of this, right? That God goes, I want good things and I love you. And he does call us to be different because of it. Not because of all the good things we do, but because of who Jesus is and us reflecting his glory. But see, we, we should, as we, we read these things and take these things on, we should be changed by the Holy Spirit, by God. And part of what we celebrate every week in taking communion is the fact that Jesus died and was buried and rose again to transform us just as he was transformed from dead to alive. That it's not about you trying to figure out how do I work harder, and yet he calls us to work, but that we can... And so as we, as we take communion, as we reflect on Ephesians 2, I think you got to be humbled and awed by the incredible transformation that occurs when we surrender our lives to Jesus. Because our past, once marked by sin and separation from God, is a place replaced by his power, his pardon, and his peace. And we become a part of that beautiful picture, the family of God with Jesus Christ as our chief cornerstone. And so today, let's embrace this trans transformation fully, living out our faith as living stones in God's magnificent spiritual temple. And may God's grace and love continue to guide us on this wondrous journey of salvation as we radiate his transformative power to the world in need. Let's pray for communion. Father, thank you that we can be transformed by you. God, we live in a world that needs to change. You can watch the news or the read the headlines for 30 seconds and just go, man, what is the world coming to? And Father, I know that you see all of it and you see all of the hurt and you see all of the pain and you see all of the death and your solution was Jesus. And I'm thank you, thankful, Father, that you brought each of us here this morning that you brought each person listening to this online to hear the power that changes. And God, I pray that you'd help us to respond to that power, God, whether we've been Christians for 30 years or if this is the first time we've been to church in many years. God, work in our lives. Work in the lives of the people that are here, God. Help us to be chance transformed. Help us to be changed. Help us to reflect your glory. And God, help us to be just honest about the ways that we lack. Help us to be those living stones that live out your kingdom, that build your church, that, that God, we're talking to our friends about the way that we, we can be changed, the way that the things that we've gone through, and yet the hope that we have in Jesus. God, help us not to uh, to try and shove that down people's throat, but help us to reflect the love, the grace, the mercy, and also not be ashamed to talk about it with, with each other and with others who are desperately seeking you. God, I'm constantly amazed as I talk to different people going, yeah, I really, I'm lonely and I need peace and I'm lost and I'm not sure what to do. We have these opportunities. We don't just open my mouth and say, here's how God can help with that. God, help us to have that courage. Help us to have that, that peace. Help us to have your love and reflect that first and foremost. But God, I know that that only comes when we embrace it first. And God, so maybe for those who are here who haven't or haven't in a long time responded to your grace and mercy, I pray that they take a step today. They reach out. They, they ask a question. They sit down for a Bible study or have a cup of coffee and and try and figure out what they can do to become closer to you. Or maybe they start going to a community group when they haven't for years and years. Because God, we need each other to build this kingdom, to live life together, to bring you glory, and to reflect that transformative power. God, help us to be transformed. I pray that as we take communion, you help us to, to one, yes, remember our past and all the sin that we were saved from but God, also to embrace the glory that is your Holy Spirit that transforms every part of our being, Lord. Thank you for the gift of Jesus.
gift of forgiveness. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name.
All right. Well, good morning, everybody. You know, I have a chance to share a few thoughts about our giving. You know, I really appreciate what Hans shared about grace and really how it's a relational, a relational connection with God. You know, I think it's easy for me to lapse into the do's and the don'ts. And I think when I, when I look at giving, you know, there's really such a relational part to that as well. And if you like, you can look at Hebrews chapter 11, uh, just the first couple of verses here. Uh, the Bible says, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. And then in verse 4, it says, By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. You know, it's amazing how the things we do spiritually are so much about just our relation with God. Right? It's not just, you know, to other people. And I love how, you know, this passage in Hebrews 11, it's such a great passage about faith. And if you read through it, you know, there's over a dozen examples of people who really showed their faith. It's, it stands out to me, this very first one is about giving. And that our giving is part of our relationship with God, too. That it talks about how Abel's focus was he was giving to God. And, uh, you know, I love that. Because you can look at all the different things about it. And I know for me, at times, it's been very difficult giving. We've had times of doing well financially and hard times. But I think it always comes back to our faith to say, I want to please God. And uh, kind of like Hans talked about, like the little kid who gets a, a great toy, you know, if we just focus on pleasing God, it really helps things line up. So, uh, you know, let's go ahead and say a prayer as we uh, give our offering. Dear God, thank you so much that you give us opportunities to serve you, that our relationship with you is both a give and a take. Father, that even though you're the master and you're the king, that, God, you call us to take part in how we can honor you. And whether it's by our littlest baby steps or by our greatest challenges, we pray that you'll help us to, to keep our eyes on you and really please you, God, by the way we live our lives. Bless this offering. God, bless this the gift that we bring before you. We pray in Jesus. Amen. <laughs> okay, well, now is the time for announcements. I'm Brittany. If you guys don't know me, I help out with the youth and family ministry. Um, um, and, okay, so for announcements, I'm just going to, like, highlight a couple things that are going on. There's a lot going on right now within our church. So please check out the website for, like, way more details and way more things that are happening. But today is our Young Marrieds Book Club. It's going to start up um, in the fellowship hall today. So if you want to be a part of that, those of you already know who you are. So it'll be back in the fellowship hall. Um, and then next Sunday, I'm super excited for this. We're going to start Sundays on Sunday, or it's just that Sunday, next Sunday, the 17th, Sundays on Sunday. So stick around after church service. We're going to be doing some um, ice cream social Sunday party. And you can also wear your jerseys next Sunday too, which is going to be way more light, casual of a service. So stick around, hang out. That'll be next Sunday. All right, also for all the brothers, we have Bro Fest coming up. That is September 23rd. There's a lot of details online, but please register so we know how much um, food to be collect or food to buy. But it's from 10 to 1 um, at Bear Creek Park, and please register. That's September 23rd. It's a Saturday. That's Bro Fest. Okay, and then our last announcement. Um, for October, I just wanted to put a plug and a save the date. We are going to do a married night out. It's actually going to be a married night here <laughs> um, on, October, on October 21st. So that will be from 6 to 9. We're going to do a lot of like really fun things. But just for all of you guys that are married, just to celebrate our marriage, um, to be together, to have a lot of fun, we're going to do a chili cook-off and some raffle prizes, some games, a lesson. It'll be really wonderful. Um, and that's October 21st on a Saturday from 6 to 9 p.m. So, okay, now we're going to close with the song. And um, if you have children down in kids' ministry, please go pick up your kids. All right, let's stand and sing. Do. My Lord heard Jerusalem when 
she mourned, early when she mourned, my Lord her Jerusalem. When she mourned, early when she mourned, when she mourned, early when she mourned. Some people don't believe in fasting. Confessing. They say confess and that's for you. Well, but if you want to get to heaven, to heaven, you better confess your sins too. My Lord heard Jerusalem when she mourned early, when she mourned. My Lord heard Jerusalem when she mourned early, when she mourned. When she mourned, early when she mourned. Some people don't believe the Bible. The Bible. They say the Bible, that's for you. Well, but if you want to get to heaven, to heaven, you better read the Bible too. My Lord heard Jerusalem. When she mourned, early when she mourned, my Lord heard Jerusalem. When she mourned, early when she mourned, when she mourned, early when she mourned. Some people don't believe in singing. singing. They say singing, that's for you. But if you want to get to heaven, to heaven you better crack a note or two. My Lord heard Jerusalem when she mourned, early when she mourned. My Lord heard Jerusalem when she mourned, early when she mourned. When she mourned, early when she mourned. Some people don't believe in Jesus. Jesus. They say my Jesus is for you. Well, but if you want to get to heaven, to heaven, you better declare him Lord to you. My Lord heard Jerusalem when she mourned early, when she mourned. My Lord heard Jerusalem when she mourned early, when she mourned. She mourned early when she mourned. When she mourned early when she mourned. When she mourned early when she mourned. Amen. You were dismissed.